In the early 20th century, one man undertook a mission to end humanity's oldest fear, famine. He was a visionary, a scientist, and the founder of the world's greatest library of life. His name was Nikolai Vavilov. He traveled across five continents, collecting the seeds of resilience, creating an insurance policy for the future of humanity's food supply. His reward for dedicating his life to ending hunger? A Soviet prison where he was condemned to die from the very thing he fought against. Starvation. This is the story of Nikolai Vavilov, the man who tried to feed the world, but whom the state starved to death. Nikolai Vavilov was not content to sit in a laboratory. He saw the future of food security hidden in the planet's most remote corners. For nearly 20 years, he became the Soviet Union's Indiana Jones of science. Vavilov led over 115 expeditions to 64 countries, from the high deserts of Afghanistan to the jungles of Ethiopia. He didn't just collect plants. He studied diversity, determined to find the resilient wild ancestors of modern crops. His goal was to harness the raw power of nature to create super plants resistant to blights, droughts, and famine. Through sheer force of will and colossal energy, Vavilov amassed the world's largest collection of plant seeds. A living library containing over a quarter of a million specimens. He was the undisputed global leader in plant genetics. As the author Peter Pringle summarized in his account of Vavilov's life, he was driven by a mission for all humanity. Vavilov built the world's first global gene bank. It was the ultimate humanitarian insurance policy, created in the most unlikely place, the early Soviet Union. Vavilov housed his enormous collection in the Vavilov Institute of Plant Genetic Resources in Leningrad. This was not merely a museum. It was the world's first comprehensive living library of resilience. For the early Soviet state, this work was a massive propaganda victory. Lenin himself supported Vavilov, seeing genetics as the scientific key to building an agricultural superpower and solving the nation's recurrent famine problems. Vavilov was given immense resources, establishing hundreds of research stations and employing over 20,000 staff. His work provided the objective truth of biology. Diversity equals security. He showed that if a specific type of wheat failed due to blight or drought, the answer was not political dogma, but a stronger gene found in a wild relative halfway across the globe. Vavilov became the youngest full member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He was celebrated, decorated, and entrusted with the entire future of Soviet agriculture. He was, by all accounts, an untouchable national hero, working at the very top of his field under Stalin's regime. The scholar Peter Pringle summarized the state of Soviet science at this peak. In the 1920s and early 30s, Soviet genetics, under Vavilov, was the undisputed world leader. But when science starts leading the government, rather than serving it, the clock inevitably begins to tick. The success of the Soviet Union was entirely dependent on its agricultural output. Yet, by the 1930s, Stalin's disastrous policies of forced collectivization had created widespread chaos and famine. The government needed a hero, not a scientist who spoke of decades, but a magician who promised miracles. That man was Trofim Lysenko. A peasant agronomist, Lysenko became the face of a movement that rejected established genetics. He called Vavilov's work, which was based on Mendel's laws of heredity, bourgeois pseudoscience. 
Lysenko proposed his own theories, like vernalization, promising to transform crops and double harvests in a matter of months. Lysenko was wrong. His theories were fraudulent and anti-scientific. But he had two things Vavilov lacked. A political background that Stalin trusted, the peasant revolutionary, and a promise of instant results that the desperate Communist Party desperately needed for propaganda. Stalin, the great arbiter of politics, now decided he was the great arbiter of biology. He sided with the peasant who promised political miracles over the academic who spoke the objective truth. The conflict was more than just a scientific dispute. It was a battle for the soul of the Soviet state. Vavilov's science was based on objective reality. Genetic improvement requires time, careful selection, and decades of crossbreeding. He needed long-term stability to ensure the survival of his seeds. Lysenko's science, however, was based on ideological fantasy. He claimed that traits acquired by a plant could be instantly inherited, perfectly matching the communist rhetoric of rapid human and societal change. It was a lie, but it was a politically expedient lie. Stalin wasn't interested in truth. He was interested in a propaganda win, and a scapegoat for the millions dying in the famine caused by his own collectivization failures. Lysenko offered both, denouncing Vavilov's careful, Western-influenced work as counter-revolutionary sabotage. As Lysenko gained Stalin's ear, the political pressure became a physical threat. Vavilov, a man of scientific integrity, could not remain silent in the face of what he knew was fraudulent, dangerous pseudoscience. He publicly denounced Lysenkoism as ignorant, irrational, and harmful to Soviet agriculture. That objective truth was his final, fatal act of defiance. In the eyes of the paranoid Soviet state, such dissent was not a scientific debate. It was anti-Soviet wrecking. Vavilov's extensive foreign travels, his international academic connections, and his dedication to Western-based Mendelian genetics were twisted into charges of espionage for the British and sabotage of the Soviet food supply. Stalin had found his scapegoat. The scientist who spent his life trying to save millions from hunger was now, politically, a traitor. The apparatus of the NKVD was deployed. Despite the rising political danger, Nikolai Vavilov refused to stop his mission. He knew his seed collection was more important than the temporary madness of the Kremlin. The end came abruptly. In August 1940, while Vavilov was deep in the fields of western Ukraine on a seed collecting expedition, the NKVD caught up with him. He was arrested on the spot, accused of being a British spy and an anti-Soviet wrecker. There was no ceremony for the world-renowned scientist. He was whisked away, and for months his wife and colleagues had no idea where he was. The only certainty was his destination, the gulag system, the state's ultimate instrument of erasure. The journalist and author Peter Pringle summarized the finality of that moment. He was taken as an enemy of the people. The arrest severed him not just from his family, but from his life's work. The scientist who traveled five continents to find life was now being delivered to the heart of death. For nearly a year, Nikolai Vavilov was subjected to the NKVD's most brutal tool, relentless interrogation. He was confined to the Saratov prison, where the political police questioned him for a staggering 1,700 hours. The goal was not to uncover espionage, the charges were fabricated, but to force a recantation of his scientific beliefs. The Soviet state demanded he denounce Mendelian genetics as fascist and admit he was a wrecker 
trying to destroy Soviet agriculture. Vavilov was physically and psychologically tortured, yet, unlike many high-ranking victims, he famously refused to completely denounce the laws of genetics. He had the chance to save his life by renouncing his science, but he would not. For his defiance, a military tribunal sentenced him to death in July 1941. The sentence was later, and arbitrarily, commuted to 20 years in the gulag. But for the tireless scientist, whose life was his work, the long-term imprisonment was merely a slower, more deliberate form of execution. The Soviet state had won its political victory. But the final act of Vavilov's life would expose the regime's cold, absurd cruelty. Sent to the harsh Saratov prison, Vavilov, the man who had dedicated his life to creating food security for all of humanity, was condemned to suffer the very fate he fought to prevent. On January 26, 1943, at the age of 55, Nikolai Vavilov died. The official cause was listed as declining heart activity, but the reality was simpler and far more bitter. He died of starvation. A man whose scientific genius could have saved millions was deliberately allowed to starve by the system that claimed to feed the world. The science historian Simon Schuster described the profound injustice. It was the ultimate irony of the Stalinist state. The man with the key to global food security was intentionally starved to death. His body was sacrificed, but his principles and his seeds refused to be broken. But Vavilov's vision achieved its final, quiet victory. While he starved in prison, his former colleagues, trapped inside the besieged city of Leningrad during the deadliest famine of World War II, fiercely protected his seed bank. Those scientists facing starvation themselves refused to touch the seeds, humanity's future, even as they died from hunger. They understood that the integrity of Vavilov's life's work was more valuable than their own survival. Lysenko's fraudulent science was eventually discredited under Khrushchev. Vavilov was posthumously rehabilitated and hailed as a hero. His seed bank survived the siege, the purges, and the famine, forming the foundation of global food diversity to this day. The truth, finally, outlasted the tyrant. The man who dedicated his life to ending famine was consumed by it. He lost his life to the state, but his vision, his seeds, won the war for science, the seeds survived. The ideology did not.